So good morning, everyone. Um, hope you're all doing well today and, um, you know, looking forward to the weekend ahead, although it, it may be a little bit snowy and cold, but <laughs> that's just part of living in Maine, I guess. Um, wanted to thank all of you for taking the time to jump on to kind of this impromptu uh, office hour with us today. Um, we're hoping to go over some recent updates to some enhancements for the AS21 platform. Um, again, you'll notice that uh, Ben has uh, joined us here this morning. Uh, he's going to be helping me facilitate um, and also demo some of the updates we'll be discussing. Uh, if folks do have uh, questions or anything like that uh, at any point during our conversation this morning, uh, please feel free to either enter your question in the meeting chat um, or if you want to uh, raise your hand either on camera or um, using the, the icon on your screen, uh, feel free to do that as well and we'll kind of uh, pause and, and answer questions as they come up. Um, so I know the primary purpose of our time here today is talking about um, an enhancement with regard to um, some things around tracking student information, um, but I also wanted to take just a couple of minutes this morning to address some I guess widespread questions that have come up recently, um, particularly for folks that are operating under a uh, site coordinator role within AS21. Um, so there has been a recent change to some of the security levels um, for different users within AS21. Um, this is because we, we recently uncovered an issue where um, the security level permissions for the site coordinator role um, were a little bit different uh, than they were intended to be in the system. Um, and we have since corrected that issue. Now, what I mean by that is that um, essentially by design in AS21, there are only two different user roles that are intended to have access to uh, what we would call protected student information, or um, you might have otherwise heard it referred to as personally identifiable student information, PII. Um, basically the types of things that are protected by the uh, Family Education Rights and Privacy Act or FERPA. Um, and that might include things like a child's um, poverty status or uh, their eligibility for special education services, um, things that would go beyond just kind of like the, the student's name and, and grade level and things like that. Um, so. Again, by design, the system is only intended to have two user roles that have access to that level of protected student information. Um, and that is largely your roles as program directors. And then anybody who has another unique role assigned to them, which is called data entry. So, um, you know, you as program directors, or if you have uh, somebody within your organization specifically tasked with assisting you in, um, data collection and reporting, um, they might also have uh, that role within AS21. So um, that data entry role is also um, a user role that could be assigned to a site coordinator uh, if it's determined that based on kind of your, your hierarchy and, and the design of um, basically how your, your organization goes about collecting and entering data um, that folks currently acting in that capacity could also have that role. Um, but this change essentially means that site coordinators do not automatically have that access to protected student information by default. Um, it's something that would need to be specifically granted to them um, based on, again, the way uh, your organization is structured and you know to what extent you want certain staff members having access to that protected student information. So um, I'm just going to pause there really quick and see if we have any questions around that before I ask Ben to kind of take the reins here and um, demo how one might go about changing or adding to an existing user's uh, permissions in AS21. Right. I'm not seeing any hands and I'm not seeing anything in chat. So Ben, I think you're probably OK if you want to bring up the system. Sounds good. Um, can everybody see my screen now? I believe so. Okay. Excellent. So uh, 
as Travis mentioned, if you have an existing site coordinator user um, and you want to grant that person access um, to the data entry role in addition to their site coordinator um, responsibilities, uh, you can do that by going into the settings tab on the navigation menu on the left side of the screen um, into program settings. And then by accessing the users card within program settings, so I'm going to click on manage users here. And if you know the specific person, you can search for them, find them by the name, um, or if you just hit search, that'll bring up the list of, of your users and you can locate the person that you want to modify. Um, I'm just going to use this sort of sample one here. If I edit the existing user record um, by clicking on the actions next to their name and going to edit, um, there's a section in the middle of the, the screen here for access information. So you see currently the access for this user is as a site coordinator at Down East School. If I wanted this person to also have data entry level access for Down East School, then all I need to do is click on grant access um, within that access information section. And I can set up the um, appropriate information here. So pick the appropriate site or district and or site. Um, if you wanted this person to have access as a data entry person for both Down East and Vine Street, um, you could just click the all sites option and that would grant them access sort of globally um, across both sites as a uh, data entry level user. Um, if you just wanted to limit their access for doing data entry um, responsibilities, having access to that personally identifiable information at Down East, then you would select that one site. Um, for the security level, then you would select the data entry security level. And when I click on save and close, we're just building up a list here of uh, levels of access for this user. So now they can um, log in as a site coordinator. They can also log in as a data entry level user. So when this person logs in, if they go up to the change credentials, um, they're going to have two options within their security level dropdown now, one for site coordinator and one for data entry. So depending on what responsibilities or what things they need to do, um, for a particular session when they're logged into the application, they can toggle between those security levels to access the appropriate information. Uh, once that, that level of access has been granted, make sure you click on the save and close at the bottom um, just to, to save those changes. Um, and then the next time that user logs in, they will have the appropriate level of access. Ben, before you navigate away from this screen, one recommendation I wanna make for folks too, is um, under the table where you have login defaults. Uh, you can see right now that even though this user has two different security levels, by default when they log into the system, they will always log in under that site coordinator permission level. So if you want to have them associated with the data entry role and you want them to have that added uh, layer of access to student information from the onset of every time they log in, you would wanna go in and update that default um, so that when they log in, they're automatically logged into that data entry level. Um, so there won't be as much need for them to toggle back and forth between the two as they're in the system. Um, it would just automatically give them, you know, access to that data entry level at the time they log in. Yep, so um, I was kind of showing that as, as Travis was talking through it, but all you need to do is click on the change defaults under the login default section and um, the, the various um, levels of access for this particular user will show up and you can choose whichever one um, should be the default for them when they first connect. The only other thing that I'll add here as we're talking about um, different security levels or permission levels for different users, um, program directors have essentially full autonomy to go in and make these updates for any of their existing staff or any new staff they might add. Um, Chris, Amy and I are also able to help with some of this if folks are having particularly difficult times in getting their um, user access uh, pieces updated, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. But um, at the end of the day, you, you do still want to make sure that the security levels that your staff have are appropriate for the scope of work that they're going to be completing within the system. So I think technically there's a there's a number of different roles that you could give your staff members. You wouldn't want to necessarily give them every role they could possibly have access to. 
Um, you really want to tailor the level of access that each staff member has to the specific work they would need to do within the system. And that's just kind of like my disclaimer for this morning, because um, we don't want to you know, get into a situation where Chris, Amy, or I are having to do a lot of um, you know, checking or cleaning up who has access to what. Um, so we are giving you guys, you know, kind of wide control to to go in and update things as you see fit. Um, we just ask that you, you know, be thoughtful and intentional when you're um, making changes to to user access levels. Any questions on that before we shift gears a little bit and talk more about um, kind of student data and some of the enhancements that we've recently pushed out to the system? So we'll we'll shift gears. Um, the other main thing we wanted to to draw everyone's attention to today um, has to do with a new uh, we're calling it a dashboard chart um, within AS21. Um, and the the purpose of this new dashboard chart is really to help um, help us and to help each of you uh, in terms of checking the accuracy of individual student information that's been entered into AS21. Now, I know you're all aware that, you know, when we create student records in the system, we as the, the state agency are asking for basically four primary data points for each child. We need their first name, their last name, their date of birth, and their state student ID. These are kind of like the minimum pieces of information we need in order to uh, effectively create a student record in AS21 that we can later then map data to from uh, the state's own student information system. Um, and that would be things like student demographic information, state assessment scores, um, you know, and kind of as we go through uh, further iterations of the system, potentially even more data that, you know, we will, to the extent we can map so that it doesn't have to be entered um, on your end of the, the system. So, uh, the primary purpose of this new chart is really to help um, uncover and correct any discrepancies between information that's been entered into the system for individual students um, and the information that exists uh, in our state student information system for those same uh, same students. So um, I'm going to hand things over to Ben here in just a minute. Um, to kind of walk us through what this new chart looks like um, and kind of how we can use the information within it to um, basically see where we have some some mismatches between our system and the state system um, and kind of talk through what we can do then to uh, correct those so that our our data aligns between the, uh, the two systems. So Ben, take it away whenever you're ready. Yeah, so as Travis was saying, um, I think it's on about the fifth of every month we're sending a file containing those four pieces of data um, to the state um, for each of your programs. So any child that you've served um, so far in the year, uh, we're sending that information over so that they can compare that to the the record that they have for each student. And um, if they find a match um, based on all four of those pieces of data. We get some demographic information back and we use that to update the records with the quote unquote official um, values for each child for their lunch status and um, special education status, things like that. Uh, but we also get back a file that contains um, error records. So if there were any mismatches based on the um, state student ID that was provided, maybe a misspelling of a name, a different date of birth than what the state has on, on file for the child, uh, we get that information back. So to make that data visible to you, um, we made the decision with the state to create a new dashboard chart. This chart exists in the registration tab of the dashboard. Um, it has not been turned on for you just yet. We'll turn it on right after the meeting today. Um, but it will contain some information um, showing you any records that were were mismatched and um, not trying to pick on Downey School here. In fact, um, they are doing a really good job. Uh, I think they've got, um, yeah, 176 youth participants and out of those just a handful um, had issues that, that were identified. So 
Um, should be some some hopefully pretty quick cleanup here, but you can see the the general um, types of error messages that we're receiving back from the state: uh, mismatched date of birth, mismatched last name, mismatched first name, mismatched state student ID number. Um, those are the kinds of things that you might see here. If I click on the view details under that chart, then it shows me the specific records that were um, causing the issues, along with the error message over here on the right. So. For example, the, the mismatched state student ID, you can tell pretty quickly here that that one is a little bit shorter than all the other ones. So it could be that there was just a typo when entering that, that record um, and a number was missed. So um, if that gets updated, then um, next month when we submit the data again, um, we should be in, in good shape to get a, a matching record back for that student. Some of these other ones, uh, mismatch first name, last name, date of birth. Um, it could be that the wrong state student ID was entered. So uh, maybe there's a sibling of this person um, and the state student ID of that person was entered in instead of the one for Alexander. So um, we've got a mismatched date of birth on that or um, various things might be going on. Could also be in a situation where um, the your local school district's student information system might have um, different data than what you have. It could be that yours is right and the, and the school district's is wrong. So that might be a conversation that you need to have with your local school district to figure out uh, what the official first name, last name, and date of birth is for the child so that you can get that entered in um, and we can, we can get that match with the state system. So um, those are the kinds of things that you should look out for here. There may be some records as well that have multiple error messages. So you could have mismatched first name and mismatched last name um, or things like that. Um, so just, I guess, keep an eye on for that. There's one other error message that might show up, which would be an invalid student ID or state student ID. Um, that will pop up if um, we do not have a state ID entered for the child in the, the student's registration record. Uh, we're sending over then the um, the student ID number or the participant ID that was entered. And in a lot of cases, that's just a system generated ID number um, that has like two letters at the beginning of it. So if you see a state student ID showing up in this column that has um, letters at the beginning of it, that's just an indicator that um, we didn't have a state ID for that child. So we sent over the local ID number, um, hoping that a match would be found on that. Um, but whatever value we sent over is what will show up here in, in the response um, demographic file errors details. Uh, so you can see uh, what data was submitted and then hopefully go and, and make that correction. Um, one note with this as well, you'll want to keep an eye on the um, updated date here. So it's kind of tiny here. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, it says updated 1-10-2024. Um, this file or this, this chart will only be updated once a month. Um, so even if you go in and correct all of these um, eight records, uh, the chart will not reflect um, the corrections until next month when we resubmit your data and get a response back from the state. Um, so that will show up here. If you want to make that dashboard a little bit more visible, because right now it'll be sort of hidden over here on the registration tab, um, from the My Dashboard tab, which is your, your primary dashboard when you, or the default dashboard when you log in, you can click on Add slash Remove Charts over on the right here. And if I scroll all the way down toward the bottom to the registration, I can add that demographic files error. Um, I realize we don't have a, a picture for that, so I could get that added in there too. Um, but if I add that chart, then it will show up on my default dashboard, the My Dashboard tab. So it just makes it a little bit more visible for you every time you log in, um, if that's a, a data point that you want to view uh, when you initially log in each day. So a couple things on this new update. Um, first of all, so Ben mentioned that the um, basically the refresh of the data occurs once every month. Um, that's kind of our current trajectory for um, pulling things like student demographic data from the state system. Um, we can, in theory, uh, change the frequency at which that happens. Um, so if we, you know, if we start getting down toward the last couple months of the reporting period and there are folks that are, you know, still trying to clean up a few student records, um, we can, as a state, kind of try and 
increase the frequency at which those are happening um, so that you guys can see, OK, you know, I, I entered this information on Tuesday. Maybe by Tuesday next week I can, you know, have an update and, and see that everything is good and well with the world. Um, but essentially what what the purpose of this is, is to kind of help ensure that for um, not only our federal reporting, but for, um, you know, year end performance reporting for each of your programs that we have as much accurate student information in the system as we can. Um, this past year, we unfortunately had a number of students with missing data in the system. Um, we didn't really have a good way to kind of communicate the information to uh, each of your programs at that time. Um, so we just more or less went um, went without. Um, this year, we can't really do that. Um, so which is why we're implementing this new kind of check and balance, if you will, within the, the AS21 platform um, to help folks kind of discern, you know, if if data is not pulling over for Travis, why isn't data pulling over for Travis, right? And then um, once you have a sense of why that is, um, there can be some follow up with, um, you know, your, your district data coordinator um, or perhaps somebody, you know, if you're in a uh, uh, nonprofit organization, one of your school district partners can can kind of help you troubleshoot um, the student information and and get the records updated within AS21 um, so that at the time we next go to pull that data over, uh, it pulls over correctly as intended. Um, yeah, and just um, to, to kind of, um, I don't know, Tack, tack on to what Travis was saying. Um, this is looking at the the report or the chart at the state level. So statewide, there's a little over 800 students um, that had issues out of the, the 4,900. So it's roughly 15, 16% of the students um, statewide that have some issue that would need to be cleaned up um, in order for us to, to get good state ID matches on those. Um, so if we were to, to end the year right now and request demo or not just demographic data, but outcome data for the students from the state, um, we'd be missing it for roughly 15% of the kids, which is, is pretty significant. So I see a question in chat from Sierra. Can you tell me a little bit more about the situation you're talking about? Sure. It was during the summer I had a student and towards the end of the summer, because it was brand new, I was just getting state IDs. Mm -hmm. And um, the student decided to not attend Fairfield for the school year and moved. And so when I asked the secretary, I was like, hey, do you have the state ID for so-and-so? And she says, I can't access it anymore because he's moved. Okay. Yeah, so there, there will be kind of some nuanced situations like that, particularly if you have like um, any transient students or families that might kind of move in and out of the district, um, you know, to the extent you can, you know, if if. You know, the district had access to that information and the student moved out of district, we would certainly still want it so that we could map the data effectively for that child. Um, but if it becomes a situation where, you know, the the district doesn't have the data and now can no longer get the data because the students no longer enrolled there. Um, you know, that would be an example of a basically just a, a record that would go without um, some of the other data associated with it. Um, I, I don't think there'd be much that we could do around that. Um, but if you do run into a situation like that, let me know. I might be able to get that state student ID on my end. Um, it's not something we've done in the past, but I think I can probably work with our data team to get that information uh, if that sort of situation arises. So yeah, if if you have a situation like that, Sierra, or maybe you have one like that right now, um, let me know and or anyone else on the call for that matter, um, let me know and I can see what I might be able to do to help kind of bridge that gap. Thank you. Yep. Um, somebody else has a hand up. Oh, go ahead, Carolyn. Nope. Carolyn, if you're saying anything, I can't hear you.
Carolyn, if you have a question, you may need to enter it in chat. I'm not hearing any audio come through for you. While we're waiting on that, Travis, um, Amy dropped an important um, piece of information in the chat. And that is that this is all connected to how your NWEA scores will pull. Um, so the more information you have correct for, or the more number of students you have correct information for, the greater number of NWEA scores you're going to have, which will help with your year end outcomes. So it's really important that we have as many correct uh, student records as possible so that you can access that information. Yes, yeah, so very good point. So um, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the basically the four distinct data points that we're looking at, first name, last name, date of birth, state student ID, they not only pull or help map required data for federal reporting purposes, so all of your, your student demographic information, but they also pull information that um, is important for year-end performance reporting for your program. So again, you know, if, if we look at Sierra's case as an example, right, if you have one student for whom there is no state student ID or for whom that data can't be mapped, that's automatically a student that would count against you to some extent for meeting some of your proposed outcomes for the program. So it's important to make sure that, you know, to the extent you can, if you've got, you know, 10 kids with errors, you want to make sure by the end of the year that you have like one or zero students with errors because you want to make sure that you're getting all of that data for as many of the students in your program as you can. So good, good point of clarification. Um, Carolyn, I did just check and you are not muted on my end. Um, so unfortunately, there's not really anything I can do to change your audio settings. Um, let me see what this does here. Yeah, the other thing, Carolyn, you could try just signing out of the meeting and coming back in. Sometimes that gets the audio working again. While we wait for Carolyn, are there any other thoughts, questions, concerns from folks? Can you hear me now, Travis? I can hear you perfectly fine, Carolyn. All right. Hey, Travis. I'm sitting in with hey, Carolyn, so that's oh, the confusion. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no problem uh, at all. Since you guys were on that move discussion, I've got a couple of students already that yep. have met the 30 day requirement, they were low performing, but have moved from the district after they've gotten assessment in the fall. Um, so if they move to another district in the state, when you do the pullover, you know, when the spring NUIA scores are on, would it pull over a NUIA score for them so that we'd have the comparison? It should, like the, um... So the student moving from one district to another shouldn't matter. The only the only thing that could potentially happen with something like that throughout the year that would uh, cause an issue is, let's say, for example, the student took the fall uh, assessment and then moved to New Hampshire or something like that and never took the comparative test. Um, but if they're if they're still within the state of Maine, if they take the basically the fall and spring assessments. Um, we as a state should have data for that child. Um, the only other thing that I'll mention with regard to student records that could kind of throw a wrench in things over the course of the year is let's say, for example, um, oh, if a child gets adopted or a parent gets remarried or something like that, and so a student's last name changes over the course of the year, um, that's something that you'll, again, want to just kind of be cognizant of. Eventually, it, it would be something that would show up in um, 
potentially uh, the error file here if, for example, you know, um, uh, you know, Travis Doughty um, was in the state system or is how I exist in the state system. But when I'm entered into, um, you know, AS21 in the spring, my last name is Braga, right? That might be a situation where, you know, uh, my last name recently changed, but it's not yet caught up in the state system. So that's, again, just kind of one of those nuanced things that that might have to be addressed as you guys are kind of working through the um, whatever you might come up with for for that demographic file error. But as far as the assessments go, Steve, you should you should be in good shape. OK, that's good. It's good news, um, you know, because that student would count because they had more than 30 days. Yep. So you wouldn't necessarily have that improvement level for that student if that didn't come over. So that's that's good. Now let's let's use that same example, Steve, right? And this this kind of gets back to what Sierra had mentioned earlier. So let's say you had that student in district for 30 plus days. Um, you know, they attended your program, they took the the fall assessment. Um, and let's say they moved to, I don't know, Portland. Um, but your your school district never got you the student ID for that child. Um, they may no longer have access to that data because the student is no longer enrolled within their district. So if you run into a situation like that, um, that's something I'd like you to reach out to uh, Chris, Amy, and myself about, because those are the types of things that we might be able to help grab that student ID um, so that we can get it in the system and then we can get the uh, assessment data mapped correctly. All right, luckily that's not the case here. But I did have exactly the situation you just mentioned where two students were adopted recently, uh -huh. um, had a change in name. And I talked to Chris about that and she made a good recommendation. Don't change it in AS21 until the school has already yep. entered it into the state database. Yep. And you can see that in, uh, what is it, main schools or whatever that is. That, um, so, <clears throat> and... It seems like the system has caught up with that. Those two students seem to be reflecting correctly in the system, so. That's good, that's good to hear. But, and also good food for thought for anybody who might have similar situations with, you know, students, legal names changing in any way, shape or form. Okay. Um, Looks like Sierra, you had another question in chat here. I don't know if you just want to voice it for everyone. Yeah, sure. I was just um, looking at my data after adding some new students, and it makes it seem like that they've been there the whole time. And so I was wondering if there's an option for adding a start date for students so that it doesn't skew our data from before, so I had some new students join in January. I don't want them to seem like they've been there the whole time and not attending. And it kind of messed up my um, attendance and percentages and whatnot before they enrolled. So it made it look like, you know, tons of kids were not attending, but they were enrolled. I don't know if that makes sense. It does to an extent, Ben. I don't know if you want to speak to enrollment start dates. Yeah, um, I know there is a um, a date registered field um, that gets set when the the record is added to the system. Um, I don't recall if that actually impacts too many of the reports, though. Um, so I'll, I'll have to do a little bit of digging on that to see if there's a way that we can we can um, sort of have the the official enrollment date of a child reflected um, so that you're not getting lower percentages on days prior to that child being um, enrolled in your site. Um, I know that um, it's something that we're looking into for future iterations of the software um, as as sort of a more formal. Um, enrollment start date, enrollment end date within a particular site, and then um, potentially even limiting attendance um, 
within those date ranges so that you don't accidentally put an attendance for somebody from three weeks before they actually signed up for your program. Um, but I'll, I'll do a little bit of digging and get back with um, with Travis, Chris and Amy to um, provide some updates on that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that because I know with I think I believe board members and staff and whatnot, they all mm -hmm. have like this start date, which helps us when we're doing um, attendance for like staff meetings and things like that. It only shows the people at that time that would have been able to go to that meeting right. and which makes sense, right? It's not that all these other staff members that don't really work there anymore is just not attending, right? So it, it works for that. But then I wasn't sure about with kids because like family events, it looked like a bunch of kids were not coming to my family events. And I was like, well, they weren't even there, mm -hmm. you know? That makes sense. I'm just curious, uh, as a follow-up question, Sierra, if you're pulling this information from a report, I am i can't think of anything that would show or reflect poorly on you, um, especially at year-end outcomes, because students weren't attending at a particular time. That's not ever really been an issue for us. Um, so I'm just curious to get a little bit more information about where you're seeing this and where that concern um, is coming from. Sure, let me just try to find the spot that I've been going. It's mostly a way to check that I'm not missing um, attendance in different areas during the day. So I usually go to reports and then uh, I believe it's attendance totals and then calendar report. I could be getting this mixed up with another one. So just bear with me for a moment here. Nope, not that one. Sierra, are you talking about like the activity participation data, like the like the number average number of hours? students participate in X, Y, or Z? Maybe now I'm kind of getting nervous that I'm saying some, you know, not like, I don't know, like okay. crazy. We, we can stuff. we can follow up. We can follow up one on one on that if that if that's OK, okay for you. Yeah, we'll yeah. we'll troubleshoot whatever we're talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, OK, I see a couple of other hands here. Emily, looks like you had your hand up. Uh, how do you? Uh, if uh, if you don't have any errors with this this new thing that's showing up on the dashboard, if you don't have any errors, would that report like not show up at all, or will it just say zero? Um, yeah, there'll just be a message that says no demographic file errors. Um, I think it's just the the text that would show up there. So Emily, you're probably looking for it right now. It's it's not been enabled for everyone just yet. We will be enabling it after we. And the meeting today. Yes, correct. I I okay. um uh was just curious because um because the information that's in there is a combination of just us and the state and not stuff that the school puts in. Uh, so if it's an error, it would mostly be on on us to fix it. Would that be correct? Yeah. So basically, the the way the errors come back is that. It looks at what's being pulled from AS21, right? So what's what's the data that you yourselves have entered for each student? And then what's the data that exists in the state student information system? If they're not a one-to-one -one correlation, the uh, we get back an error file from the state that says, you know, uh, Travis Dowdy's birth date was XYZ, in AS21, but according to the state system, it's something different. Um, so it would, you know, it would indicate that there would be an error with regard to my date of birth, and that would be something that I would need to um, get figured out. So if that was an issue, we'd have to see if it was on on our end, and if it wasn't on our end, then I need to contact the school to fix it or the database. No, so if if there's an error on your end, you would of course be able to fix it. Um, mm -hmm. If the error exists in the state system, which could happen, um, it would be a matter of coordinating with whoever the um, 
the district data coordinator is. Um, so for mm -hmm. you guys, it would be a matter of reaching out to whomever your contact is in Westbrook mm -hmm. um, and, you know, getting their assistance and getting that that student record corrected. OK, got it. Thank yeah. you. And just to note with that, too, even if um, Westbrook were to update their information, if they're not pushing their data up to the state system until next quarter or something like that, um, then that'll continue to show up as a as an error in the response that we get because the local district's information only gets sent up to the state a few times a year, typically. Got it. Good to know. Thank you. Yep. Uh, let's see. And just a quick like historical anecdote, I guess. Uh, we used to request from the district free and reduced lunch and so many other demographics. So when you're talking with your districts, you're requesting really for for um, indicators instead of traditionally it was like eight, right, Chris? So um, so it really is um, a smaller ask for districts, and really it's the student state ID number because a lot of you already have first, last name, and date of birth on your registration forms. Carolyn, I see you've got your hand up. I don't know if that's from earlier or new, but feel free to jump in if you have a question. That's that's a new one, Travis. OK, yep. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, so in reference to those students that moved that already great or made the 30 days or greater uh, mm -hmm. in the program before they moved um, in that registration log for those students to ensure that they continue to show up on our reports to show that you know they benefited the program the way they did do we enter an end date or do we just leave it open so they continue to show up good In question yeah um Jen, yeah. can you help me with that one? I'm I'm not entirely certain what the answer to that would be. Yeah, we don't really have an enclosed or uh, enrollment close date. Um, okay, yeah, that's I another didn't thing think that, so. that we we will be adding in in future iterations of the software. But um, you can mark a child as not active, um, and that will prevent them from showing up on um, printed um, attendance rosters. So, um, and there'll be a little notation on the record uh, if if you're editing your rosters, either group rosters or session rosters, there'll be a notation saying that that child is not active. Um, but that's that's more just for uh, um, informational purposes for yourself. It doesn't prevent um, you from recording attendance for them after that date or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that that's something that, um, as was mentioned earlier, we're doing it with the, um, the staff members and the board members. Um, so we want to get that added in for the um, for the youth participants as well to have the the range of dates in which um, they're expected to be present and then um, not quote unquote counting it against you if they're um, if they're not attending after they've uh, left your program or before they enrolled. So the, to the clarify really about the reporting piece of it whether those students that moved away but already have met the 30 days or more will continue to show up on the reports. So, yeah, Ben, the, the, I believe the question is, if, if Steve were to go in and exit a student or mark a student inactive who has since left his program and or the school district, um, if that student had already reached 30 days of attendance, if he would still or his program would still get quote unquote credit for that child when it comes to kind of the different year end reporting calculations that we do. Gotcha. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, any child who attended at all. Um, so for the, the annual performance report, for example, it's anybody with at least one day of attendance gets counted toward that report. Um, and the 30 day threshold is still important for, for the yearly reports for the state. Um, but yes, any, um, historical attendance information that have been recorded for a participant um, will stay even if you've marked a child as as inactive. Um, that's just an indicator that moving forward, we're not expecting them to be participating, but it won't impact their historical attendance um, or their their um, visibility on reports. OK, great. Thank you. That does answer their question. 
Alrighty. Any other thoughts or questions from folks? Does everyone feel like they have a pretty good level of understanding of how to get in, kind of check this new dashboard chart, update their users if they need to? And sorry, Travis, just as a reminder for me and probably sure. information for other folks, um, what roles or what security levels are we going to have that chart enabled for? This chart here, you mean? Yes. Um, great question. I would say probably we'll want to keep it to um, the same user roles that have access to um, the individual student record pages. So I would say okay. program director and, and data entry. Okay. Um, since it's non-PII, should we do it for site coordinators as well, if they have the ability to update that information? Um, we can talk about that separately too. Yeah, we can, we can talk about that because I, I don't know that... Um, so site coordinators would be able to, if they were access the chart, they would be able to see who has what for errors, but they would have no control over correcting it unless they also had the data entry role. Right. So I don't know. I'm, let's do a quick pulse from folks on the call today. Would it be helpful for you if you have folks in that site coordinator role who, um, you know, might only be taking student attendance and creating activities? Do you, would you want them to have access to this chart, or is this something that you'd prefer to have access to on your end? I think the chart is good, but the details, they shouldn't be able to see the details. So I don't know that we have. We can do that. We can do that. OK. Yeah, we can separate them. OK. Other th thoughts? I see a couple of thumbs up from folks, but um, OK, let's let's go with that for now, Ben. Okay. And if we need to make any sort of changes down the road, we can explore them at that time. Okay, and Carolyn or Steve, did you have another question? I do. Sorry to have so many questions. No, no, Travis. you're fine. You're fine. This is more we're here probably for. for Ben. It's about this um, dashboard, and I see that you can add or remove. One of the things that would clean up the dashboard for me is those two boxes in the upper left-hand corner, those totals. I don't see how those really help us any. I don't know what we would use the a combination of a youth and adult together. Um, unless Travis, you have some idea of how we would use that data, but can we remove those if we want to? Um, I don't think the the tiles with the numbers on them are removable. I can check on that though um, to see if there's some way that we could hide some of those. Um, but I will follow up on that as well. Yeah, I mean, Steve, I get what you're saying. Um, I really think in terms of their usefulness to you guys, I mean, if you're having, you know, if you're having conversations with your advisory boards or potential funders or things like that, and you want to be able to, you know, tell them, you know, this is how many students our program serves, this is how many families we serve, this is how many total you know, individuals in our community that our program has had an impact on over the course of the year. Some of that might be helpful, um, but, you know, as far as like state reporting is concerned, I mean, most of the information here gets pulled in other places anyway. Um, but I think, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, this is, this is more or less just kind of like a default design of the system. Um, so it's, you know, its usefulness could vary depending on who you are and and how your program looks and kind of who you're communicating with on a regular basis. Okay. Um, all right. So we're we're a little bit ahead of schedule here. We do have a few more minutes. I don't know if other folks have other questions, concerns, anything like that they might want to talk about or. You know, if if we're in good shape, I don't mind closing things early and giving folks some some time back in their morning. So I'll pause for just a minute. If folks have other questions, thoughts, feel free to throw something in chat, raise your hand and we can 
take care of that this morning. Otherwise, we'll um, we'll adjourn here in a minute. All right. Well, thank you all for your time this morning. Um, that's going to conclude our, our office hour here. If you have other thoughts, questions, or concerns that come up, um, you know, once once we conclude this morning and Ben's able to get this new dashboard chart enabled for everybody, um, feel free to reach out to Chris, Amy, or myself, and we will help uh, in whatever way we can answer any questions you might have, um, or if you're you're needing to troubleshoot some, you know, student demographic related information, we're certainly willing to lend a hand there as well. So thank you all. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend and um, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. And I'll get the, the chart turned on right after the meeting. Thank you, Ben. Thank you all. Have a great weekend, everyone.